broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Greetings, everybody. Uh, my name is John Raphael, and I work with the National Alliance for the Rec Support Professionals. And I am so happy to be uh, kind of co-presenting today our final installment of our series, uh, the 10-part webinar series uh, that we are doing along with our friends at the Regional Centers for Workforce Transformation. And those are funded by the New York State Office for People with Developmental Disabilities. And we've been working in partnership with them for, for quite a while now to, to bring educational materials to direct support professionals that are meaningful and that can be used. Um, and to that end, the Code of Ethics, which uh, has been around for a reasonably long time for direct support professionals, we chose to really feature and go in depth with it, and we've created this 10-part series. This is the final installment. Uh, I'm looking forward to it because I think it's kind of the grand finale because I'm, I'm going to be doing this, uh, this webinar with a, a friend and a colleague of mine, which you'll, you'll meet here in a couple seconds. But just a little bit about the webinars, uh, just uh, so you know, um, they're meant to be short. They're meant to be about uh, 20 minutes. Um, we're not going to do questions and answers with this particular webinar um, because uh, Tish and I are going to, we're going to talk the whole time. Um, and I think you'll see why, because we've got a lot to talk about. Um, not that we don't want your questions. It's just that this particular webinar, I want to feature Tish as much as we can. Um, as I said, these webinars are sponsored by the New York Regional Centers for Workforce Transformation. And um, these webinars will all be archived. They're all recorded, and they're all going to be archived on the Regional Centers for Workforce Transformation website, which is workforcetransformation, one word, dot org. And, and they'll also be uh, on our website, the National Alliance for Direct Support Professionals website, uh, in our archive as well. These are very valuable, rich uh, resources for direct support professionals and, and people with disabilities and family members to to get access to and they should use them. So without further ado, I get the great pleasure of introducing my friend who is on the left side of that screen. I'm on the right side of the screen. Don't look at that picture. Look at the person on the left because they're much, much nicer looking than me and much more important in this webinar than me. This is Tish Alcorn. Um, and Tish is a, she's a self-advocacy consultant with the Regional Centers for Workforce Transformation, but uh, I've known Tish for quite a few years now, and I met her uh, in the self-advocacy circles around New York State. And, 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 and furthermore, uh, Tish is not only just a, a great advocate uh, for people with disabilities, but she is a, an advocate for direct support professionals. And with that, I'd just like to say welcome, Tish. I'm very glad you're here. I don't know if you want to say a couple things about yourself before we begin. Um, sure. Thank you for having me on this, first of all. Sure. And you are 100% right that I advocate for the direct support professionals because I know their value and, and their worth. I know how valuable they are in my life. And I definitely want to keep them around because I know my life will not be the same without them. So I'm really thrilled that I've got an agency that really helps me do that. So it's that's, cool. That's really, really cool. And, um, you know, I kind of chose that picture because it's uh, you can't quite see it. But you're at the Capitol. You're at the New York State uh, Capitol. I think one of the legislative, I think the legislative office building, where you've spent a lot of time uh, doing exactly what you just said. Uh, because I think you get it. I think the the people at the regional centers get it. That without direct support professionals, um, you know, acting in a way uh, that's ethical and working with competencies and working with intention in partnership with people with disabilities, I just don't think our system can, uh, it's, it can't sustain. And um, we need to, and I know you've been doing it for years, and we've been doing it, we need to make sure that direct support professionals get all that they can possibly get to be to be ethical and to be competent. And that's kind of what today's about. Um, so let's get right to it. Um, it's the final uh, webinar in this series. There's nine uh, tenets of the code, nine parts to the code, and they're in no particular order of importance. Um, this just happens to be the, you know, the last, the ninth uh, statement around the code of ethics, in the code of ethics, and it's advocacy. 
And when we started to think about putting these webinars together, um, of course, we thought about how do we do this as much as possible in partnership with people who receive supports. And I think the first person that I thought of was, was Tish um, when it came to this particular piece of the code, advocacy. Um, and you'll see why as we start to talk together. So this particular code, is this is the statement. This is what it's all about when it comes to being ethical as a direct support professional in terms of advocacy. As a direct support professional, I will advocate with, with the people I support for justice, inclusion, and full community participation. And essentially what we're going to do in this webinar is just I'm going to kind of just go back and forth with Tish and just get her thoughts and some stories around each of these statements that we're going to be seeing for the next few minutes. So that said, um, Tish, what do you think of that statement? And when you hear it, when you see it, and, and actually, what does it mean to you? Well, I, I agree with you that the word with is really important, but I, I think the most important word in here is I, because it can start with one person. It can start with one direct support professional advocating and really making sure that the with is with their individual. Um, mm -hmm. You don't really need to wait for a group, but I think that you can start with one person. And so that really spoke to me that I will advocate with the people. It's not your frontline supervisor. It's not your coworkers. It's you. You're going to do it. Wow. So that was pretty cool to me. Yeah. No, that, you know what? That's a real great angle, you know, at this, at this statement. And, you know, just as you say that, it's like I'm thinking that direct support professionals sometimes, um, they, they don't feel, they don't feel empowered, you know, I guess that's the word. They feel like there might be um, a supervisor's approval that's needed or a, a family member's approval that's needed in order to, to, to go down this road. But what you're saying, that's not necessarily the case, is that it can be done and it should be done uh, out of the will of that direct support professional? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 really cool. Doesn't mean that you know um, you don't include your supervisors or or people's family members uh, in 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 situations where you know you might want to get other people involved, and we'll get to that in a second. But um, when you think of the words, you know, justice, inclusion, and the well, the statement, full community participation. Do you have any stories that uh, you could share, maybe when you were working with direct support professionals, where they helped you with that in any of those areas? So when I think of full community, um, I think about how I wanted to go to college. And I didn't really have a lot of supports to help me. I, I did, definitely didn't have the high school diploma to go. Mm -hmm. um, so I had to go back and get that um, in EDP, which is an external diploma program. And I had a direct support professional who was working with me then. And he was just starting to really like help me with the math portions of it and, and struggling with it. He knew I could go to college if I put my mind up to it, even before I did. I, I just wanted to go and, and see if I could take a class or two. He knew I could totally get a job in this even before I did. And so full community to me meant that things that I didn't even realize I could do, I can. And with the help of my direct support professional, I mean, he ended up coming to sit in classes with me mm -hmm. to help take notes. He read my tests to me. He helped me study. I think I've seen him more mm -hmm. studying my homework than when he was studying his because he was also taking college classes at the time. Mm -hmm. He was studying my stuff more than his. So if I got stuck, he would be able to help me. And, and it really gave me the chance to have that feeling of full community and, and to be included in, in education, which is what I wanted. Wow. Well, that's really great. I, you said the word with, I was counting them, <laughs> you know, well, you sent it a lot. So this particular DSP was with you through this process. Didn't do it for you, you know, didn't maybe pushed you a little bit here and there, but probably didn't do it to the point where it was pressure, right? Um, I would assume, I would hope. All right. He, he would have to push me um, 
for math class because I would get so frustrated mm. with myself that I would always want to say, you know what, I just want to drop this course or not take it. Mm -hmm. Philosophy was another class I had a hard time with and both of which I needed to um, actually get my diploma. And I was struggling with both of them. And philosophy is where um, my direct support professional really shined with me because and it was totally with me because at one point I was like this professor was picking on me I really don't want to take it anymore and he said well I, we can quit but we could beat him at his own game and, and I remember sitting there saying okay I like that idea better mm -hmm. so we studied more we worked more on it and I passed that class with a B plus even though the professor did everything in his power to help me feel like I couldn't do this um, we did it together it was pretty awesome that's awesome. That's really great. That's a great story. Awesome. Really, really cool. Um, let's just go to the the supporting some of the supporting statements for the for this particular code of the ethic code of ethics. Um, so, just check this out because I think this I think you'll have a lot to say about this. Um, furthermore, so obviously you're going to do as a direct support professional. You're going to advocate with the people that you support for justice, inclusion, and full community participation, but Furthermore, as that direct support professional, I will support people to speak for themselves in all matters and offer my assistance when needed. This is one place that I know I've seen, and I've, I'm guilty of it too. I, I, you know, you, you interject sometimes when you probably need to just be quiet um, and let somebody else take their time. Um, what, what do you think of this? Have you had experiences where this, is, this has been the case? Have you had experiences when people didn't let you speak for yourself? Not really, because I'm pretty big on and like um, speaking up for, for situations, but I know this is something that I'm going through right now, that, and I'm starting to transition from um, Herkimer Area Resource Center to go to Oneida. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I'm not really big on speaking up for myself. I'm, I'm really actually almost um, intimidated at the idea of trying to do that for myself, and nobody really believes me on that, but I have a, a lady who's helping me in Oneida actually use my voice down here so I can get things rolling so we can move it. And um, it's kind of funny because I'm a great self-advocate until it comes to me. Hmm. So. I, I really never had the experience of speaking up for myself because before I started to be a self-advocate, I had my mother. So my mother used to speak for, for me about different things. I can honestly say college was one of the few things that I actually advocated on my own. Mm -hmm. And I was just scared at the thought of doing that. And then also um, I, I advocated the very first time for the parenting housing to be built here in Herkimer because at the time I thought I would be able to raise my son uh -huh. and that was the one time when um, I, I didn't know if I could do that and I had a direct support professional who really kind of spoke for me mm -hmm. because I wasn't sure I could do that and then I kind of got a little agitated with the idea of like well that's great what she said but that's not what I meant mm -hmm. and I ended, I ended up kind of over speaking her and after that that's kind of how I bent, I've been because um, I don't want anybody to misinterpret my feelings or thoughts and advocate them in the wrong way. Exactly. Exactly. I th yeah, you just hit that right of the, the nail on the head there because I think that's one of the reasons that this is part of the ethical obligation for direct support professionals that they, they really, really need to understand fully what they're helping somebody advocate about and advocate for and like you just said it you know this person probably had very good intentions but was not quite getting your message across you know and that's that could be bad you know um so really that that's so important i think it goes back to you got to know you know the person you're working with um and at that time they this was let's see 2004 so they didn't have that yet mm -hmm. so they didn't really know me she was just saying well she'd like to have visitations with her son no I wanted to raise my son yeah. and, and she didn't get that at the time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so like I'm thankful for the core competencies now because it was like yes that's it that's what I've been trying to say yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so that was kind of cool that they know us now yeah yeah and that's you know that's one of the things in the competencies about about a discovery you know this and 
if I'm going to work with you, if I'm going to work with anybody, if I'm going to work with you, I need to discover uh, things about you. And that's, that, that's all about relationship. And that takes time. That takes patience. Um, I'm sure it can be frustrating, especially when, you know, um, maybe, maybe, you know, direct support professionals who, and I, I'd like to know your opinion about this. Direct support professionals that work with people that might not use words uh, might have a real profound communication disability, whatever that might be. Um, what do you, do you have any suggestions for them um, uh, for direct support professionals when they're working with people who maybe don't use uh, like like the voices we're using right now? You know, uh, any suggestions or ideas? I know um, one of my direct support professionals, he kind of, and, and my current one, they kind of know my body language. When I walk out my door in the morning, they know what kind of day we're going to have. If I'm out on time, they know, okay, we have a lot of stuff to do. If I'm running late, then there's not a lot of things to do. And, and you know, I'm kind of just taking my sweet time. So I, I do think that you, if you really know the individual that you're working with, you can tell by their body language, you could tell by the look in their eyes, you can just tell so much from, I mean, I'm married, Michael, my husband doesn't have um, any problems communicating, but I know just from studying him and, and learning about him, what kind of night we're going to have, depending on his body language when he walks in the door from work. Mm -hmm. So I don't really necessarily agree that just because they can't vocalize mm -hmm. their situation that you can't figure out what's going on. I don't buy that at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. I'm with you on that because I think, you know, I don't know the 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 real, you know, the scientific uh, percentage, but I do know it's it, it, it when when communication is studied, um, a lot of communication between human beings specifically is nonverbal communication. Like you said, it's their body language. It's it's um, you know sometimes even intuition and and, and gut feelings and that kind of thing. So. That's good. I'm, I'm glad you addressed that the way you did. Um, let's go to the next one. Furthermore, as a direct support professional, I will represent the best interests of people who cannot speak, themse speak for themselves by partnering with the individual and their support team to gather information and find alternative means of expression. So it's kind of going deeper into what we were just talking about. Um, What's a, what's a good way to do that, you think, Tish, in terms of who who should direct support professionals, who should they rely on in a person's circle? Um, who, is it family members? Is it guardians? Is it other direct support professionals? What's your take on that? And how should they approach that? Well, obviously, you should listen to the, the individual that you're working with first. But if for whatever reason you can't, reach or connect with them, then I would find the person that they considered their closest friend, mm. not so much a relative. Because a lot of times I see with relatives that we want, they want what's best for that person, mm -hmm. but they don't really know the person mm -hmm. that much. They, they think like in my situation with my mother, if you go and talk to my mother, she would have told you that college was not a good de idea for me because I struggled so much in high school. Mm -hmm. She wasn't in support of it. She didn't understand it. But then when you talk to my friends and my friends told you like, no, Letitia would be great at college. This is what she wants to do. And she just needs help doing it. They were able to actually advocate for me to help me get into programs to go to college and, and get my ADP more than my mother because my mother was like, she wanted what was for best for me, but she didn't really know what was best for me because she never really asked me. Mm -hmm. Or my best friends didn't have to ask. We're not going to have somebody sit there and say, well, what can I do to help you? We're going to tell them, I really want to go to college. We're going to tell them our dreams. We're going to tell them our goals and our failures. We're going to tell them all of that. And they're going to be the ones to really be able to say, okay, you know what? She can't speak for herself right now because she's upset or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I know that she has told me in the past that she would like to do this and, and she doesn't want to do this anymore. And so I really think the circle of friends is a, is a very big deal. And I think that not a lot of people pay attention to that. Great. Yeah, that's that's awesome. That's great advice, and I think everybody that's listening needs to really, you know, listen to that again, to repeat that, you know, when you play the webinar back, if you if you do play it back, because I think what you just said is so important. So uh, I, I yeah, hear here on that one. Um, 
How about this? This is interesting, and this deals with, I think, that photograph of you. Um, furthermore, <laughs> as a direct support professional, I will advocate for laws, regulations, policies, and procedures that promote justice and inclusion for all people with disabilities. What, what's your take on that? that that's, a, that's a mouthful. Well, I don't think it, it should be just direct support professionals that have this oath. I think everybody in the world should have this oath that we should be advocating for laws and regulations and policies on a regular basis because if we're supposed to obey these laws, then we should have a say in them. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't just be something that we don't understand. It should be something that they break down for every ability known to man so that everybody understands it so we can all follow the laws and we can all grow and, and be better individuals out in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, like, you're, you're absolutely right. This is a big thing for me. I'm always advocating for laws and regulations and policies. And mm -hmm. I want what's best for not just me, but my son and all the future generations to come. So if we want to do that, this is the way to do that. That's awesome. Yeah, I know. Have, have you ever been... Have you ever been frustrated in the, in the process of advocating for something like a law or a regulation or whatever it might be? If, if you ever been in Albany speaking to somebody or to a politician and gotten frustrated or anything like that? Oh, absolutely. I don't like the word no uh -huh. at all when it comes to this. Um, in college, I, I discovered something that um, secondary teachers, so college professors, they do not have to be CPR and first aid certified. And that was one of the things that I was advocating for because the, the school nurse or the college nurse, she had hundreds of thousands of other students. So every time I had a seizure, mm -hmm. I would wake up to a police officer staring at me and having no idea what to do. And the nurse, I was never to be found because she always had some results. And I was told from one of my professors that he was CPR first aid certified, but he wasn't allowed to help me. Mm -hmm because of some crazy law or something that said he could only help if he was a coach. Mm -hmm. and I actually advocated for all secondary teachers to be CPR and first aid certified. Um, because even if you're just choking, by the time that the nurse came down from her office or whoever could get to you, you could have been dead. Mm -hmm. You could have been without breathing. Um, so I, I did advocate for that. And I, to my knowledge, that hasn't changed at all. And it's very frustrating because it's, scary for me personally, knowing that if I have a seizure and I quit breathing, nobody knew what to do. Oh my goodness, sure. And it could be 15 to 20 minutes before an ambulance comes. So um, it's very frustrating. Okay. Um, that's actually something I just advocated for again on legislative day. Okay, good. I think it is. I, I think this probably out of all the statements about advocacy, this is probably one <clears throat> that, that can be frustrating because laws and regulations and policies and procedures, all of those things, they, they take time to create and then they certainly take time to change, you know. So with that, especially like you and I, we're probably more impatient than the next person about these kind of things. It can lead to frustration, but it's also we have to get support with each other and not to give up and to, uh, to continue, uh, uh, to continue pushing for advocacy. So um, great. I think there's a, another statement here. Um, it's interesting. This is, um, I think it's also an expansion on the last one, but furthermore, as a direct support professional, I will promote human, legal, and civil rights for all people and help those I encounter to understand these rights. How, I, that's beautiful. I love the way that... I love that. You know, um, it, have you had this experience with 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 DSPs? Have they have they been? Have you seen them do this? Um, I've seen direct support professionals go to the Capitol building with our self advocacy group to advocate for um, the living wage. Mm -hmm. Sure. So for their wages to be up, and I I think that totally falls under this because it's a human right for them to be able to go home and have everything that they need, and, and they don't. Um, there was one video that I seen on the Be Fair to Direct Care that haunted me watching it. And it was from somebody in Pennsylvania. And uh -huh. She took you in her home and she didn't have the things, the basic things that she could have just to have a normal life. You know, a couch. Who takes that for granted? She can't afford a couch or anything like that. And it was like, this is ridiculous. 
any human should not be living like this, mm -hmm. whether they're a direct support professional or a veteran or whoever. And so to see direct support professionals actually go and advocate for more um, increase in pay, to me, that was like the most beautiful thing I've ever witnessed in a long time to see direct support professionals doing it. And to see self-advocates partnering with them on it, that's a, I think that's a very big deal. I think as a self-advocate, we kind of take our direct support professionals for granted a little bit. Mm -hmm. We think they're always going to be there and we don't really need to advocate for them, but we do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, you, 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 boy, you're speaking, you're speaking the truth there. Um, and I think that's something that I know about you and about certainly I think what the regional centers in New York state have, have been doing, it is about this. It's a, it's a bigger picture, you know, it's about, yes, of course it's about people with disabilities and, and making sure that, you know, uh, everything that we can do to promote equality, um, for people with disabilities is, is done. But we also know, and I think you know more than anybody, uh, that, that probably ain't going to be done, that that can't be done without a workforce of direct support professionals that are in partnership, you know, and um, understand, you know, all the things that happen with discrimination, that happen with um, uh, whatever it might be uh, that happens to, uh, to people with disabilities. So, um, great. So, I think... This is the, the 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 final skill statements, if you will, for the the tenet of advocacy. So, furthermore, as a direct support professional, I will seek additional advocacy services when those that I provide are not sufficient. That's the first part. I will also seek out qualified guidance when I'm unsure of the appropriate course of action in my advocacy efforts. And lastly, I will recognize that those who victimize people with disabilities must be held accountable. There's a lot there, those three statements, but I think they're the they're the, the kind of the punctuation and they're the exclamation to this is what you need to understand about advocacy as a direct support professional. So what is your take on on, on those statements, uh, Tish? Well I think the one that, that speaks out to me the most or just offhand is um they're going to seek out qualified guidance. I think that is so um, much needed. I think direct support professionals have gotten a bad reputation over the years. And I think that they are so afraid to ask for help because I think in, in their mind, they're going to think that somebody else is thinking, hey, they're doing a terrible job if they need help. I mean, mm -hmm. come on. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've actually heard people say that, you know, Letitia is a hard case to work with. And, and, so people have actually went to get guidance from other people and, and their guidance usually is just look out mm -hmm. when really it should be something like, okay, how can we help engage Letitia in conversation to advocate for her son? How can we help her to be able to have the lifestyle she wants instead of, you know, not getting the guidance because you're afraid of backlash or fear or, or feeling like you're a failure. I think you're more of a failure if you don't ask for guidance right. than if you do. Right. Yeah, I think uh, that's so important. And I, you know, it can be intimidating, I guess. Um, direct support professionals work a lot and they work alongside of other quote unquote, you know, professionals, um, whether it's a nurse or whether it's a, a therapist or a counselor or whatever. Maybe it's an occupational therapist. Maybe it's a doctor, you know, or whatever, a physician. But I think sometimes DSPs, they need to understand that it's okay. And not only okay, that they're obligated to seek out, you know, when they're unsure about something. And, um, and I think the last statement there, we are, you know, one of the few states in the country, if not the only state really in the country that has something, you know, called the justice center, which, um, you know, uh, that's a, that's a, that's, that's a big deal. That is a, a, a law enforcement agency, you know, obviously that New York state has to make sure that people that do anything harmful or, 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 or abusive to people with disabilities, they can, you know, they can, they should be held accountable. So DSPs need to understand that, at least in New York State. But for those that aren't, aren't that are listening to this webinar from other states, it doesn't really matter if you have a justice center or not. You know, you have to recognize that anybody that victimizes people with disabilities, they have to be held accountable. And um, so I guess one last question for you. Um, Tish, is what do you have as 
advice for direct support professionals, as I'm thinking of even kind of newer direct support professionals who maybe haven't worked in the field that long, but it could be for anybody. What do you say that they have to understand about advocacy? What's the most important thing to understand about advocacy and advocating as a direct support professional? God, that was a loaded question. Okay, so um, one of the things is that it's always growing and changing. I mean, it's not stopping. Um, things that we advocated for today, tomorrow could be fixed and we're advocating on for a whole new thing. Um, so just like take each moment for what it is and, and see how the beauty in it, see the bad in it, because if you don't see the bad in it, then you don't have a reason to advocate. Um, advocate for change for you, but advocate for yourself, for the, for the individual that you're working with, because they're not always going to be a self-advocate. They're not always going to know what to do. With, um, and even if they're great self-advocates, I'm a great self-advocate. Mm -hmm. I am intimidated when it comes to advocating for myself. My son, my husband, the direct support professionals, I can totally do that. But when it comes to advocating for myself, I'm very um, intimidated on some circumstances. I'm not sure why. Mm -hmm. But encourage us to kind of come out of our shells little by little and and bridge the gap between us and the rest of the world because we're not always going to be able to connect with that. Right. And I think if you don't, um, if you don't really love the people that you're working with, and I'm not saying like you're in love, I'm saying like, if you don't get to the point where you are seriously worried about, you know, how things are going to go for this person, where they're going to grow, if, if that's not on your heart or your thoughts when you're sitting with them in the vehicle and you're, and you're not thinking, then I think you're in the wrong job. Um, because this, this job is not a big paying job, but it pays off in the heart department. You have a lot of people who will just love to know you, love to have you in your life. Um, this is something that I'm dealing with right now is I love my direct support professional. She's amazing. And I have to leave her this week and mm. I don't really know how to say goodbye to someone that great. So if you touch somebody's life the way that my direct support professional has done it, then you've done your job and you've done your job well. And, and you deserve to be proud of yourself. And if you think that you're not doing that, then you need to step up your game. And I think the core competencies and the code of ethics, I mean, there's tons of things out there to help you step up your game. So there's really no excuse for not. Mm -hmm. and, and I just think that people need to like, just do more growing. I think this is probably the, the most richest job you could have in the sense of you just always learn you always get to um an opportunity to just love on somebody and to grow with somebody and to witness things that's going on in their lives i mean one of the greatest things that people have told me that they've got to witness was was seeing my husband and i get married and see how we've grown and changed from that and they played a role in that because if i never went to college then i would have never met my husband so that played a huge role in it um, so I just think, I don't know, that's my words of wisdom. I, I think that embrace every moment that you have because it adds into the big puzzle of our life. And that's all we really want. We just want a life. Mm -hmm. Well, there you go. I think, uh, that is called in the business, a mic drop. I think that's what it's called. I don't know what it's called, <laughs> but what it's called is that's wisdom. And I have nothing but thanks. Uh, for you and all you've done for the regional centers and what you continue to do and uh, what you continue to do for direct support professionals. Tish, it's greatly appreciated. So I want to thank uh, Tish Alcorn for being uh, 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 our guest on this final installment of the series on the Code of Ethics um, for the regional centers and for the National Alliance for Direct Support Professionals. So with that, um, we will see you down the road. And again, thank you, Tish. You're welcome. Thank you.